GCAP, and it's my privilege today to uh, introduce and present GCAP Presents. It's a first of our speaker series. What we've been doing within GCAP over the last, coming up on a year now, is been two kind of areas. We've been doing some academic stuff in terms of some funding, we've started a support program, as well as some events. I'm really excited by this new series that we've, we've got called GCAP Presents because it starts to introduce and integrate the two. So it's where we can start to take some of the knowledge and some of the academic skills and start to look at them in real life things, as well as obviously kind of in more of an event series. So thank you all for being here today. I'm certainly excited by the talk. I'm excited to launch this program. We're looking to hopefully run a few of these throughout the year and we'll see what we can do and where we can grow. So if you have any feedback for us afterwards, please don't hesitate to stick around and have a chat. We do have some cafes coming afterwards, so we'll get some food to mix and mingle and talk about the interesting points that Dr. Tan is going to make. Now I'm going to hand over to Michelle Rana, who's our Vice President and our Director of Academic Services, to give a little bit more detailed description of introduction to Dr. Tan, and I look forward to chatting to each of you after the presentation. So, Thanks, Jeff. So, hi guys, uh, I'm the Vice President of GCAP, and I'll um, introduce Dr. Tan. First of all, Dr. Tan, thanks for coming uh, and giving us a precious time to present this. So Dr. Tan, uh, a little bit about him. Uh, Dr. Tan is the founder of Born Wireless, an Australian-based mm -hmm. award-winning wireless software application and services company. He's the recipient of the Queensland Government's Entrepreneur and Resident Fellowship for 2010 at Bond University and Griffith University Innovation Center. Uh, Dr. Tan uh, is a founder member of the Gold Coast Angel Investors as well, which he has uh, funded a number of innovative companies around the Gold Coast. Uh, prior to his academic career, Dr. Tan worked for a number of multinational corporations like the Citibank uh, in the strategic and technical trading unit. He's also worked at the Northern American Investment Bank in Wall Street. Dr. Tan obtained his PhD from Bond University and his Bachelor's of Science from Electrical Engineering from the University of Southern California, where he further went on to complete a Master's of Business Administration in Finance and a Master of Science in Industrial and Systems Engineering. Dr. Tan is a fellow of Australian Computer Society. He has over 45 academic and academic um, publications, including a book, a book chapter, and peer reviewed papers in the area of soft computing and mobile applications. He has been invited uh, as a keynote speaker in a number of events before, uh, like the Mind Valley Malaysia, the Awesomeness Fest in Bali, uh, the Global Investment Panel for Singularity University at NASA Ames Research Park, and the Computer World Congress in Brisbane, and very recently TEDx Youth in Malaysia. Dr. Tan is also currently the Australian and Malaysian Ambassador for Singularity University, which is a think tank based in NASA Ames Research Park in uh, Silicon Valley. So please, please welcome, uh, please join me in welcoming our first speaker of the GCAP series, Dr. Clarence Tan. Thank you very much, Michelle, uh, for the intro. Actually, now I'm the uh, regional ambassador for Singularity, but thanks for that. Um, okay, well, thank you, thank you all for coming, um, you know, on a Thursday. I know you could be shopping. Um, let me just um, uh, go through what I'm going to talk about today. I'm basically going to tell you about this uh, experience that I had one summer in 2011 where I was given the opportunity to go to Singularity University at NASA Ames um, in Silicon Valley and learn all this latest technology. Obviously, you guys are all post-grad students, so what I'm going to talk about would obviously be quite impactful in terms of uh, what you'll be doing when you graduate. So. Okay, you see me in a lot of these photos, not that I look all that great, um, it's just that I, you know, I, I was preparing some of these talks for TEDx and uh, you're required to make sure that you have the copyright for all the photos and so on and I thought it's easier to use photographs of, that I took myself or of me. Um, so Singularity University is actually located inside NASA Ames Research Park where the research center is and right next to Google. So you see this building, um, you know, this building here on the, uh, the arrow dome. That arrow dome, uh, if you go there now, is totally stripped uh, because what happened was they were trying to remove asbestos and stuff like that. Um, and uh, then the US government cut the budget and they couldn't afford to put it back on. So if you go there, you see this big skeleton. 
uh, one of the world's largest working space, the way they used to land the, the, uh, the airships. So Google came to the rescue, if you read a couple of weeks ago, they have leased this, they're going to put it back on, and they're going to park their private jets there. Because Google's right next to Singularity, at least NASA. Uh, yeah, so. Um, so Singularity University, uh, it basically is sponsored uh, by Genentech, Autodesk, Nokia, Cisco, all, all the big guns that you hear about, uh, Google and so forth, and NASA obviously. Um, and you see this 10 power, 9 plus sign everywhere. And the reason for that is uh, Singularity has this sole mission of basically educating, inspiring, and empowering leaders to use exponential technology to, um, to what they term uh, address grand challenges that we face, like poverty, space, security, food, water, and so forth. So it started as a non-profit about five years ago, founded by these um, two people, um, that's Ray Kurzweil and Peter Dibendis, and I'll talk a little bit about them because they're pretty interesting people. If you haven't heard about them, uh, hopefully you read some of their books. Um, so on your on on your lap, I guess um, the uh, two the, the two books that um, Ray is very famous for is the Singularity is Near and the Transcendent Man, and those two books actually became movies. So I actually haven't read Singularity is Near, but I have watched the movie. Um, very interesting. So what he talks about is basically how technology is moving so fast that um, basically like computing power, right, is doubling in uh, speed, in performance, um, you know, in terms of storage sizes, every 18 months, the more slope, right, growing exponentially. And that technology will move so fast that in a very short space of time, probably by 2025, we will have computing power that's faster than the human brain. And we'll be able to essentially merge with a machine and live forever in a machine if you want to. That's where the term singularity came about. Um, a bit about Ray Kurzweil, he's a prolific inventor. So if you don't know who Ray Kurzweil is, um, he was the first person to develop a computer-generated music um, when he was 17 years old. And he was very, very motivated to try and find a solution for blind people to access books. So he basically created the first uh, machine for, it's called the reading machine for the blind. Basically an OCR scanner. So if you use a scanner, the CCD scanner inside it is actually invented by him. If you're using a mobile phone, you're using Siri or Google Voice, um, you know, Google Voice recognition, it's also developed by him. But Nuances actually um, used to belong to Ray. So what happened was um, uh, uh, Ray became good friend with Stevie Wonder. The, you know, you, you guys know Stevie Wonder, right? He's blind, he's a fantastic pop singer. Um, and, and Stevie Wonder was very grateful that he now could access books that previously he couldn't couldn't, uh, you know, obviously you have all the books in Braille. Uh, so he, he said he had a problem, he told Ray, he said, is there any way you could perhaps create a device for me to play instrument, compose music on different instruments because, uh, you know, being blind, he couldn't play all the different musical instruments, but he could play a keyboard. And that's how the Kutzbowl synthesizer was born. So if you see all the brand, Kutzbowl brand on the uh, pop bands and all that, it actually belongs to, uh, used to belong to Ray, he sold it to a Korean company. For those of you interested in health, I highly recommend a book called Transcend. Ray talked about how um, you know, our body basically has been programmed to age. Because for survival, um, it was best for us to age and die off uh, once we have passed our sexual peak. Right? Once we have kids, it's best for you to actually pass on, you pass on those resources to your, to, your, uh, to your offsprings. But now we are living in a world of abundance, right? food and everything else, so we don't really need uh, you know, to age. And he talks about how you can actually stop that. He talks about how, every, you know, if you can stop aging or reverse it and live for 25 years, you'll be able to extend your life by another 25 years and perhaps live forever. Um, and his most recent book last year was How to Create a Mind. So he's trying to create his super, his super brain, right? And he was going to raise money and start this new company. And then Larry Page from Google said, why bother? You know, we will uh, give you all the resources you need, just come work for us. So for the first time in his life, he's an employee at Google. He's a director of engineering there. So he's working on this huge project. So let me talk a bit about exponential computing, right? So growth of computing. Right now, we have the computing power to simulate a worm. Okay, so that, or insect brain. In a, in a couple of years, a mouse brain. By 2025, when I said the human brain, by 2050, we can we have the power to simulate every single human brain, human brain in the world. What are you going to do with all this computational power? But first of all, um, 
How many of you are familiar with exponential curves? Yeah. Okay, cool. Most grad students, excellent. Research methodology, right? All right, so normally, you know, I ask people, you know, what is between an exponential and linear? See, our human brain is very, very good um, in recognizing linear type of uh, situations. So when you write a project plan, you have phase one, phase two, phase three, right? You don't go from phase one to phase 25, right? So if I said, you know, um, if I said, Marjorie, you know, if you take one step a meter, in 30 steps you would be? Very good, linear, right? But if I said, one, you take a meter a step and double it every time, 2, 4, 8, 16, in 30 steps you would be? 26 times around the earth. <laughs> a billion meters. So that's how fast technology is moving, and this is the technology that I'll be talking about. So the other founder of Singularity University is uh, Peter Diamandis. Peter, as you can see here, is pretty short, but he has always wanted to go to space. Um, so, you know, he has got a medical degree from Harvard University, you know, a biochemistry degree from MIT. Uh, he wrote this book called Abundance. If you haven't read it, I highly encourage you to read it. The future is better than you think. He talks about the positive side of technology. The problem with, um, with uh, our reptilian brain, the reference of our reptilian brain, the amygdala in our human in our, in our brain, um, is that we always pick up negative stuff. You know, if a lizard comes in to this room right now, it will look around for two things, right? Food or danger. Mm -hmm. And that's what our reptilian brain actually picks up, like the damning dollar. So we always look for danger. So that's, that's why you notice that the news is always bad, right? You never, you never hear a lot of good news. So, so Peter is talking about how technology has the power to change things and change things in a very, very disruptive way and a positive way. You notice this book, the cover of the book looks like an aluminum foil. The reason for that is because Peter Diamandis talked about how aluminum, which is the fifth most abundant um, element on earth, was also the most expensive metal on earth in the 19th century, before the discovery of electrolysis. In fact, he gave an example of how Napoleon III actually served the king of Siam with aluminum plates and aluminum cutlery because it was, most, it was more expensive than gold. So when they discovered you know, like, you know, the way to uh, extract oxide, uh, aluminum of oxide, the prices, you know, felt, you know, in an instant, right? So right now we don't even think about wrapping our food with aluminum foil and throwing it away. So Peter Diamandis is also very famous for a number of companies that he uh, initiated, like Zero G and also the X Prize Foundation. If you don't know what the X Prize Foundation is, it is this competition that uh, basically Peter came up with about uh, maybe almost eight years ago. So. He basically wants to go to space, right? I say it's pretty short, so he, he you know, obviously he would not qualify to be an astronaut in NASA during those days. So he was thinking of a way, how, he, how can he go to space, um, you know, uh, you know in, in a cheap manner. I don't know whether you guys know, when NASA was using the shuttle, the space shuttle, it cost $20 million to send one astronaut, okay? So what Peter and I just try to do is actually bring down the cost of, uh, of uh, space travel. And he was very inspired by Charles Lindbergh. Charles Lindbergh flew, flew across the Atlantic Ocean to win a $26,000 prize money. Um, and that's equivalent to about $200,000 today. And that money was actually put up by a hotelier in New York because he wanted to encourage uh, flights across the Atlantic Ocean so he could actually get more business. Um, but that $26,000 prize money spurred a lot of people who wanted to win the prize money and I think it basically uh, gathered about equivalent of $1.2 million of R&D funds. Um, and, you know, within 10 years, people were flying across passenger airlines across the Atlantic Ocean. So he wants to do the same for space. So he came up with the X-Prize, and you guys probably seen this, right? This is the space, uh, Richard Branson's the Galactic, um, Space Galactic, which will fly off this year. And the cost is about two hundred to $250,000 uh, per passenger from $25 million or $20 million. And Peter has got a ticket. And NASA actually bought two tickets because they have no way to go to space now <laughs> at all <laughs> with humans. Um, and now with the Russian issue too, so you know, and Russians are the only one with rockets and uh, the Chinese, I guess. But uh, so it's a bit of an issue. Um, but the interesting thing with Peter was that he took a huge risk. He essentially um, said that anybody who can uh, uh, fly to space and land and then fly again within 48 hours would win. Uh, $10 million in prize money. He did this without securing the sponsorship. And guess what? Uh, somebody won. <laughs> and he didn't have the money. 
Um, he actually approached Branson, but Richard Branson said that he only invests in proven technology. Uh, lucky for him, the Ansari family came in, and then you know, when this technology was proven, Branson came in and bought the rights to it, and so it's all good news. So the other, the other, prices are, the other X prices that are going on right now um, is the, uh, X, the Google Lunar X Prize. The first person who can land a robot on the moon, move 50 meters, take a photo and send it back to Earth, would win $40 million in prize money and $40 million in, uh, in uh, uh, contracts with NASA. And this one, the 100 over 100, that has been scrapped. It was basically uh, to bring down the cost of sequencing of genes. And I'll talk more about that in a while. But it was to sequence 100 genes of uh, 100 gene sequences of people over the age of 100 years old. The, why you want to do that? Because if you can find a common genetic material of people who live a very long uh, age, perhaps you can find a secret to longevity. But uh, the price of sequencing of genes has fallen faster than Moore's law, so that's why they scrapped this because they want to bring down a thousand. Now it's actually fallen below a thousand. Um, and then there's the Qualcomm $10 million Tricorder X price, together with a $2 million, I think, a Nokia uh, mobile app price. The first person who can create a mobile app that can better diagnose uh, medical uh, problems of patients, better than the board 10 or 10 doctors, would win this prize. So this is all, all going on right now. So, a bit of Singularity University, if you, there are two ways to get to Singularity University. You can apply directly to the program. For this year, it's closed. Um, they look at your academic skill level, 30% have PhDs, so you guys are in good, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in good uh, state with getting in. But 20% have no degrees, because the second criteria is entrepreneurial skills or leadership. 20% um, are people like Zuckerberg and Jobs and Gates that actually felt that university is a waste of time, and um, so they don't actually uh, bother finishing a postgrad degree or all of an undergrad degree. And the third thing is obviously your passion to try and solve grand challenges. Um, as you can see, the number of applicants have been growing exponentially. Uh, it's harder to get into this program than it is to go to Harvard Business School. It's like less than a 2% chance. The year I applied in 2011, there were 2,200 applicants. The year after me, it was 4,000 over, which is why Singularity then decided to change the way that they were ending students. So now, almost half the places now are basically given out to competitions around the world. And we're still trying to raise funds in Australia to send the second Australian from the Global Impact Competition here. Um, so Malaysia, we just got one, so I'm flying up next week to do the judging. We had 70 applications there. Um, and basically, uh, I'll tell you, you know, uh, what you get to do once you get there. So this is my class. See, we're the fun class. Um, so you can see, right? I mean, you know, we have people from over 35 countries, right? We have this guy from Saudi Arabia. We have this girl, uh, Alayi, my classmate, from Palestine, right? And she was sponsored by the Israelis. The Israelis sent at least three people from competition, and they have like six or nine people every year. Uh, from South America, from everywhere around the world. Um, in my year, there were actually three Australians, so it was a good uh, outcome. And this is where you play Fine Clarence. I said Fine Wally, no, anyway. <laughs> Um, so what do you do then? It's a 10 weeks program at NASA. You, you live uh, and eat there and uh, you know, stay with 80 of the most amazing people you've ever met in your life. You know, like I, last year I met this um, AI expert from Utopia. Like, you know, I mean, I, I didn't know that uh, you know, uh, this guy existed, but you know, it, was, it was an amazing guy. I mean, it's, it's all kind of amazing people that you meet um, you know, in one place. So it's a 10 weeks program. The first seven, five to seven weeks, you get taught all the latest te technology from all the top people that you see in all the TED Talks and so forth. Like Steve Wozniak and so forth. And I'll show you a little bit about the people that I've met. Um, and then your final three to five weeks, you work on a project that will impact the life of a billion people positively within 10 years with your fellow classmates. And any company that's spin off by Singularity, they take 2% stake. 2%, okay? As opposed to Australian universities who take 25 to 100%. Um, so, what do you work on? So you work on any of these areas, global health, water, energy, environment, food, education, security, poverty, and even space. You know, NASA used to sponsor a space um, area. Um, and, and you work with your classmates and so forth. So the competitions, like the ones in Malaysia and the one we ran last year in Australia, you come up with an idea to impact a million Australians within three to five years. And then when you go over there, you pitch your idea to your fellow classmates and try to make it a global one and impact a billion people. 
Um, so as you can see, they have the graduate study program, they have the executive programs, and so forth. And they also, uh, so Singularity is really a part university, part accelerator, and part think tank. It will never, it's not an accredited university. It can never be an accredited university under the current rules we have, because more than 50% of the course material is changed every year. The technology is moving so fast. It doesn't make sense to stick on to the same uh, material. If it doesn't work, they switch it and then they, they teach uh, new stuff onto it. So you learn things like 3D printing and so forth. So who are the speakers that you see? So you got people like Vin Cerf, the father of the internet. You know, uh, you got Nobel Prize winner like uh, George Mood. Dean Kamen is a very interesting guy. He invented the Segway machine, but he also invented this thing called a slingshot. Uh, it's also mentioned in uh, Peter's book. Essentially, it is a um, it's like a filtering process for the dialysis for people with kidney problems. And what he has done is basically make clean water with it. Um, and now he has got Coca-Cola to put one in every single bottling plant in Africa. Um, Aubrey Gray, the guy out here, um, he is actually a very interesting person. He told us, you know, basically the seven reasons why we age. And there is a solution for every one of those seven reasons. The problem is that um, it takes time to get a solution up and running. So again, as, as in, uh, as in uh, Ray's case, he basically talks about if you can live for 30 years, you'll be able to extend your life another 30 years. The technology would have advanced then. And you could you know, perhaps live forever if you wanted to do a thousand of years, um, as long as you don't get knocked down by a bus or a tram in a Gold Coast. Um, and, 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 and I think the guy that you guys really should know, um, if you haven't heard about him, Craig Venter. Have anybody heard of Craig Venter? Yeah, okay, well, cool. Well, Craig Venter, right? This is the guy, right? Keep it up, and this just set up a new company with Craig Venter uh, to basically find a solution for longevity. Craig Venter in 2010 is the first person to create an artificial life. He basically programmed the entire DNA in a computer and inserted, inserted it into a shell of a bacteria, and now it's multiplying and growing. If you sequence the DNA of this bacteria, you will find the 42 names of the scientists that work on this project, its own email address, and its own website address. What's the big deal? Well, the big deal is that if you are able to program bacteria and viruses, you can basically make it do things like uh, make algae that can convert sunlight into more efficient um, energy. You could perhaps use it to target cancer cells and kill it off. You can do a lot of amazing things once you can program life itself. So this is what um, Craig Venter is famous for. And these are the faculty at Singularity University. Uh, Dan Croft, um, you know, the guy up here, he is uh, famous for his, um, um, he's famous for his TED Talks on quantified self and personalized health and so forth. He said, like, why do we spend so much money towards the end of our life? If we had spent it at the beginning of our life, we wouldn't have to spend it towards the end of our life. And basically be more responsible for our own health rather than try and see it. Um, you know, uh, sick a medical professional every time you know you have a problem, and he talks about how he can use technology and so forth to do that. Um, anyway, let me just. Uh, I mean, Brent Templeton. He is the founder of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. It's the non-profit association that's looking after your privacy. He actually gave a talk. Uh, one of the benefits of being a Singularity alumni is you get to watch the um, lectures that are given every month for the executive program for free. Um, and one of the things he talked about was Bitcoin. Uh, this was before Satoshi was even revealed. I mean, he already knew who he was, but he basically said that, you know, one of the suggestions, suggestions he gave um, the founder of Bitcoin is to give away, because, you know, the, the guy owns about, right now, probably about one, uh, over a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin. He can't basically sell it in the market because everybody would know that the founder of Bitcoin is selling his Bitcoin. So he, he suggested, why don't this guy donate it to a charity? I mean, that's why Bill Gates have a Gate Foundation, right? Because if Bill Gates will sell his Microsoft shares, everybody would panic. So if you give it to a foundation, which gives out to a charity, then that's, that's uh, you know, it's part of uh, basically trying to do some social entrepreneurship um, and be, being able to um, quantify his wealth. So this guy, um, if you don't know who this guy is, his name is Ralph Merkel. He's one of my heroes because uh, he actually is one of the co-inventor of PGP if you are into encryption for email. This is one of the inventor of PGP. So he is also well known uh, for his, uh, um, for his uh, nanomolecular 
uh, engineering uh, techniques. So he's like the foremost expert in nanotechnology manufacturing. So what is that? That is making a very, very tiny machine to make stuff. Okay. So in the very, in the very near future, you can think of repurposing this glass and you know just like a replicator in Star Trek and moving the molecules in the, in the atoms and repurposing it and turn it into an iPhone if you want to. Uh, so there'll be no pollution and there'll be like the utopia of uh, of uh, of uh, of this tunnel uh, world. Obviously, the biggest warning he gave us is like, don't make this nano, you know, if I'm making nanobots, like small little robots that go around and so forth and make stuff and things for you, just don't make them intelligent, okay? Because it's also the ultimate weapon, right? You could just disassemble you and you'll be basically be a part of the atomic uh, thing. So, what you see here looks like, uh, looks like um, um, the Empire Strikes Back uh, Death Star, right? It's actually leukocytes, they are nano machines that carry oxygen more efficiently than your leukocytes, your blood cells. If you um, inject this into your, into your bloodstream, you can survive for four hours underwater without breathing. Okay. I cannot confirm or deny the Navy SEALs has it, but I can tell you that if you go to my blog, um, the, um, the UK ambulance services has not a, don't have a nano size one, they have a micro size one, a million times bigger. And they use it for people that have uh, lung, collapsed lung due to inhalation of smoke. If they inject into your bloodstream, you can survive for 30 minutes without breathing until they take you to the hospital. And down the track, you're going to have these nano machines going into your bloodstream, and you'll be looking for cancer cells or any pathogens or any viruses and kill it before they have a chance to make you sick. And this is another one of my heroes. So my PhD was actually in artificial neural networks applications in finance. And uh, this guy is Andreas Wagen. He is famous for his, uh, uh, you know, uh, he's, he's, he's famous for his work in neural networks. When he graduated from Stanford University, um, he went and worked for uh, Amazon.com as a chief data scientist. And now he's back in Stanford as the professor in social media uh, data mining. You notice his T-shirt? He has got this QR barcode on it. He gave it to all his postgrad students. So whenever you guys take a photo of his students and you've got a QR code reader, he will automatically upload the picture and tell him where all his students are. So it's a way of tracking you guys. And at Singularity University, it was not all about technology. It was why we were doing it, right? So this guy, I mean, you know, this guy, his name is Evan Madongo. He's from Kenya as an engineer. You can't see it here, but his glasses are really thick. He's almost legally blind. Because when he was growing up in Kenya, he lived in a tent using uh, kerosene lamp. If you know anything about kerosene lamp, it's really bad for your lungs and really bad for your eyes. So he's almost legally blind. So when he became an engineer in Nairobi, he came up with this idea called Just One Lamp. So it was CNN Hero of 2010. He created this lamp that allows uh, the villagers to build it for $5, assemble it, charge it up during the day, it's a solar light, right? So during the night, you can actually use it uh, to read. Um, and look who's sitting behind me, right? That's Steve Wozniak. I and mean, these are the kind of people you meet on a day-to-day -day basis at Singularity. Um, you know, Steve is famous for uh, obviously being the co-founder of Apple, but he also has this thing called the Wozniak test. He talks about um, how, you know, if you can send in future, you send a robot to a random home. It goes to your kitchen and make you a cup, good cup of coffee, then you would, you would assume that it has passed the Wozniak test uh, without instructions. Um, so this guy, I didn't know who he was and did this to him um, at the time. He's actually uh, uh, Anish Chopra. He's the uh, head of, uh, he was the first chief technology officer of the White House. He reports to Obama. And this is the funniest thing in the US, right? One of the biggest problems they have right now is migration, skilled migrants. So one of the VP at Singularity University, Vivek Wadwa, he writes for Washington Post. He was telling us a story about, you know, he was testifying in the Congress. Uh, he used to lecture at Duke University, and you know, 10, 20 years ago, um, and he would have Indian students in the class, and he would ask them, like, how many of you are going to stay in America when you graduate? Everybody put their hands up. And this time when he asked them, like, how many of you are going to stay in America you know, when you graduate? And everyone, they laughed at him and said, why? Okay, the, the problem is, I don't know whether you guys know, if you apply for a green card, a skilled migration visa in the US as an Indian citizen, how long do you think you need to wait to get your visa? Five years? Two years. Two years. Seventy years. Seven zero. 
Okay? Because US has this policy that they have 132,000 visas every year and they give each country 7.2% of the nationality and the majority of people studying in America are Indian and Chinese. So if you're a Chinese citizen, it is 20 years. This is ridiculous, right? So you could be studying at some of the top universities at MIT, at Princeton, at Yale, at Stanford. It doesn't matter, you know, they can't get you a visa. So guess what's happening? The Blue Sea is born. So, you know, the VCs in the, in the Valley, Silicon Valley, they want to hire the top brains of the world, right? They want to set up a company with an Indian citizen or a Chinese citizen, they can't give you a visa. So they're creating this uh, platform, an incubator, anchoring it 12 kilometers off the coast of California, so it's in international waters. So you don't need a visa. And then the boats that will take you to San Francisco uh, every hour. It is crazy, right? So that's why I'm telling the Australian government we should be sucking these guys in here, right? Um, and, and I don't know whether you guys know, like the Chinese, the Chinese actually, when I was there, are recruiting not only Chinese citizens to go to China, they're recruiting anybody to go to China, to set up companies and so on. Because um, at the end of the day, I mean, that's where the future lies, you know, in innovation and so forth. This guy is Astro Teller. Astro Teller uh, is the head of Google X. If you know Google X, they don't want to get on the Google Glasses, the Google Car, all the very high-end Google stuff that uh, Google works on. They call the X projects, right? So he's the head of Google X. His name is Astro Teller. His, uh, one of his grandfather is Edward Teller, the father of the hydrogen bomb. And the other grandfather is a, father, is a, is a Nobel Prize physics winner. Um, but what was interesting in his lecture was that he said, you know, Google, have you guys watched internship in a uh, movie, you know, like trying to apply a job at Google? Well, you know it's very hard to get into Google, right? It's like an eight months, nine months process. So what was really interesting in his talk was that he said, you know, if somebody come up to him and said, um, Astro, I got this brilliant idea, you know, I'm gonna make this thing and you know, Google's gonna make a lot of money out of it. I need some funding, you know, and, and so on. You know what he'll tell the guy? He'll say like, oh, don't worry about it. I'll give you a six month bonus. Just forget about the idea. Like, I didn't understand this. Like, why would you hire the best brain in the world? and then tell them to forget about the idea, right? Why, why don't you make use of it? He said, ideas are cheap. A lot of people have a lot of ideas. It's all brilliant people. But what he wanted to see was that they were committed to it. They were passionate about it because he doesn't want to give you a whole team. And then after six months, they're like, yeah, it doesn't work. You know, then you would have lost not just you know, your time, but everybody else's time. And he said, if you're really passionate about it, even if I say no, you would still do it anyway. So that's, that's Google's uh, idea of, uh, it's very interesting, uh, the Google's idea of how they manage people and so on. So other things you get to do at Singularity, obviously, is go for site visits. So you know, you go to Facebook, Google, you go to NASA. Um, so NASA's original name was the National Aerospace Commission on Aviation. Um, and this is the uh, wind tunnel testing for NASA uh, for up to Mach 12, 12 times the speed of sound. And the crane will lift the ships in there. And this is an amazing thing for a geek like me, right? I, you know, they allow me to walk inside the supercomputer center of NASA and take photos and walk around and do anything I want. This is at the time it's the seventh fastest computer in the world. Um, so these are the banks of computers at NASA. Uh, those are the backup hard drives, as you can see, you know, uh, behind me. Um, but the problem was that uh, NASA spent all the money on the hardware. They ran out of funds for backup. So if the power goes off, only. 10% uh, of the machines will be running. So it's really sad. And you can see, this is the hyper wall. This is where they use the supercomputing power to simulate the entire space shuttle when it's flying. So they can see what's going wrong, uh, what, 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 what will be going wrong with it, you know, and so forth. And that's basically starting all the um, wind flow of a helicopter blades and so forth. And you can see it's a live video of uh, how it actually works. Uh, this, is, this is all the uh, Weather patterns, you can see uh, Hurricane Katrina being formed in real time and so forth. So they get data from NOAA, from the satellites, from the buoys in the ocean and so forth. And you can see how the weather prediction stuff works. And all the ocean currents of the world, you can see it's out here, uh, you know, in real time. That's what they use all this computing power for. And then you get to go into the 747 and uh, do, play around the flight simulator. And at Singularity, you have so many opportunities to do so many different things, including going on the space shuttle simulator. But because um, it's a bit complex, right? They want to make sure you don't destroy the uh, simulator. So at Singularity, you actually have to pass a test. You only have six places for people to get into, the program, into, that, into that simulator program. 
Um, so what happened is you actually had to use a Microsoft Flight Simulator, fly a plane, I think 737 from Office Field in NASA to San Francisco Airport. And mid-flight, um, what the head of uh, the robotics at Singularity is also a three-time astronaut. He would program it so that one of your engines steal or something and you will have to land it safely. If you do that, then you can go and take part in the space simulator. I didn't, I didn't try it. Uh, anyway, my, my, my classmate who actually passed the test tried it and destroyed the simulator that was out of uh, order for the next two weeks. <laughs> and then this was the, um, this was the um, air traffic control management system. It's a 360 degree system that it allows you to view um, to create air traffic control programs. So like all the air traffic control management software that you, we are using right now, all developed at NASA, at, actually at NASA Ames. I took a photo of this because notice this, Qantas was grounded even then. So I thought it was pretty interesting. Um, and this is the, uh, this is the uh, NASA, uh, this is the US Army Drone Research Center at NASA. It's amazing, let us take photos of it. This is a small drone, right? But it was stripping this, this helicopter and making it into a drone. It's actually operational now, I think, in uh, Afghanistan. It has got like a 50 gigapixel camera, so you can zoom in for recon stuff. And the interesting thing about uh, NASA is that, I don't know whether you guys know, but um, the moon is full of uh, minerals like platinum and helium-3. So there are like 19 companies around the world um, working to uh, mine the moon. I don't know whether you know about the Chinese landing the rover like two months ago in, on the moon. It's called the uh, something rabbit, you know, I can't remember what it was. But they actually had sensors to detect where the, mine, where, where the, where the minerals are and so forth. Um, because they found water on the moon, which means that you can go to the moon with less energy to come back with because you can get hydrogen off of water. The other thing about, uh, about uh, NASA was that they told us that they cannot make the moon habitable, but they can make Mars habitable. They can terraform Mars. Right? The good news is we can all go to Mars and live there. That's the good news. The bad news is it's a one-way ticket. You can't come back. Okay? Because the gravity is much lower there. So people like me will feel really great there. But when you come back, your bones will crack. Right? Um, so, so there's already a project going on in Europe. I think by 2025, they want to send like uh, 4,000 people to Mars. It's a one-way ticket. And they're going to make a reality movie like Big Brother kind of thing. Um, so you can apply actually if you want to. Um, the only problem is when you get there, you might find that you know there might be aliens there that uh, I want you to go home. <laughs> so the other site visits that you get to go and visit is like Google, right? Um, I mean, this like this, I think these guys have the most cushy job at Google. What do you think they do? Security, Security right? I mean, fighting off nerds. How hard can that be? <laughs> right? I mean, you know. Um, and, 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 the, and the beautiful thing about Google is that um, I love their policy. Like, you cannot be more than 150 feet from food and drinks from any office, free. Um, they serve you shark oysters every day if you want. They have this Chinese station, Japanese station, you know, and they have like beef and broccoli, like, oh, not your conventional beef and broccoli, they actually have calf beef. Um, you know, it's like amazing stuff, right? I mean, you know, like, I really enjoy Google. And the good thing about Google is that they actually have a website called google.org, I don't know whether you guys go check it out. Google actually spent 2% of the revenue doing social good. So like during the Fukushima earthquake, um, Google spent their own resources taking all the photographs of uh, people who wrote down in Japanese, um, you know, all the missing person, and then basically put into a database so they can locate each other and so forth. And also, what Google does is, when you guys get sick, right? When you get a cold or whatever, what do you do? Go on Google and search for flu medicine or what's the best flu cure or whatever. Google tracks that and give it to WHO and CD um, and the um, CDC, right? Center for Disease Control, and so they can map and see. Uh, where the epidemic is spreading around the world, all for free. Um, so Google is pretty amazing, you know, you get out, if you get a chance, get out there, you know. And this is the uh, Google Android office, as you can see. And you know, the, the first Android that came out was like, you know, the Eclair or the Gingerbread or the Honeycomb. Um, you know, every time, they, every time they bring out a new model, they actually bring out one of the sculptures. And that's the Google Street Map car. It goes down on the screen and takes photos of all the streets that you see. And you've got Google bicycles that you can go riding around in it. Facebook, on the other hand, was totally different. I wasn't allowed to take any photos except what you see there. And uh, in fact, this is the last time you'll see the Facebook moniker on the building because they moved to a new headquarters now in, uh, in Menlo Park. And they basically said that uh, all you're going to see is a like sign. And the reason for that was because they said they don't want uh, their fans and also uh, protesters to disrupt their work. So, um, they allow you to take a, you know, they have this Facebook wall and this lobby here. Every time somebody connects somebody on Facebook, it likes up. 
And the reason why I don't invest in Facebook, even though I use it quite a bit, is as you can see this big dark spot here. It has China, it's banned in China. So uh, some of the world's biggest market, you can't use it. This is in front of Singularity University. So these are some of the faculty cars. Uh, you know, uh, this is um, the head of Autodesk, uh, chief designer. I mean, he has the old convertible, and then you got the first Tesla the electric car, Roadster. And this is the Google Stealth Navigation car. And this is my dream car. This is the Google. This is the uh, Tesla X, right? It's an SUV, zero to one hundred in four point four seconds. Actually, four seconds. But uh, no seven seater, golf wing, you know, and, and uh, basically a falcon wing. And essentially, when you uh, open up the trunk and the boot, it's all empty because all it has is just batteries and two motors, one in the front, one in the back. And if your car breaks down, you don't even have to pick it up and fix it. They'll send somebody to change the parts because there's really no parts to change. I mean, it's electronic parts. So that's a bit of the future of uh, self-navigation cars and so forth. Um, now let me talk about exponential technology, right? And you have probably seen some of this stuff, like uh, the study various, you know, 3D printing. Um, Essentially, the study various, as you know, is a very rare instrument, right? Because the person that the craftsman is dead. But you can 3D scan it and 3D replicate the entire study various violin. Um, every nuances, every nook and cranny, the wood, um, and, and, and have almost an entire uh, full simulation of it. Um, sorry, and, and, and also, you know. Um, you, you know how I talk about singularity is, uh, is, is, is the singularity is near in terms of uh, how you can merge the machine and so forth. Um, this is actually connecting your hardware, which is your computer, to your webware, your brain. So I always tell people, you know, when I'm teaching uh, uh, AI and so on, um, you can one day perhaps download your entire memory onto a machine, right, and, and live forever in it. Uh, and you've got a crappy day, you just put it up to a day, you felt good. Just don't forget the backup. <laughs> so, so what are some of the 3D printers? Like some, some of these, you, know, you can 3D print in tons of materials right now, including chocolate, which is really cool, right? And this car, the Irby, is also a 3D printed car. And some of this stuff can only be 3D printed. You cannot actually make it by hand. And the year, look at that. There's a 3D printed year. Um, and they are looking at 3D printing hard. They already done a liver. Um, and actually, when I was at uh, Singularity. Um, they had a the lady from Harvard University that worked with some people from the University of Minnesota. They took a rat's heart, washed off the heart so that only the scaffolding is left, put it into a jar, injected stem cells onto it, and then grew it on the scaffolding uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the heart. And then basically, after two weeks, it grew into a full rat's heart. They shocked it and it started beating it. Right? Then they said that they don't even need to uh, take, a, take a, a rat's heart to print it, to get the scaffolding anymore. They can 3D print that. So some of the amazing stuff that's happening out there. And this is the Autodesk Gallery. Everything you see here is 3D printed. Okay, the motorcycle, um, you know, everything you see here, you know, like uh, the adventures and so on. But the really cool thing is um, this guy, Scott Summit, he gave, us a t he gave a talk about how he used 3D printing to, pr to produce uh, good looking prosthetics for people who have lost their limbs. I guess it's not a good video, but uh, not a good picture, but it's a bikey that lost his leg. In US and they created a um, 3D printed leg that matches his bike. Um, you know, the lady matches her dress and so forth. The people you know, who lose their limbs sometimes are very embarrassed about the uh, prosthetic limbs that they have, and this one makes them look good. And in fact, some of them actually are even more uh, efficient than your organic ones. So, I was telling you about the uh, wetware to the hardware thing. So, it's not that far fetched, right? It's really the Google Glass, right? Right now, the Google Glass, I have to read the information. So, I look at Paul. I, it, it goes through on my glasses and I read who Paul is, my brain has to interpret information. What happens if I plug this directly into my brain so that I don't have to be here? When I shake hand, you know, when he shakes hand my avatar, I can actually feel it because it's all, all, all connected back to my brain. Uh, and that's where, you know, technology is moving uh, in, in some instances. And Watson, you guys heard of Watson? Watson is an AI program that um, was developed by IBM. It defeated a human contestant in Jeopardy. Um, and last year, Watson basically has been found to be better at diagnosing cancer than human doctors. Watson has read over 4 million pages of medical journal. So I don't know whether you know, your, your GPs have read 100 pages or not, but I don't think mine has. Um, so what's happened is, in the very near future, 
you might actually get all your vital signs and vital data, your blood markers and so on, send it onto the cloud. And something like Watson, Watson actually is making their application available as an open source uh, project. And uh, IBM is spending, I think, over a billion dollars um, allowing Watson to be used. So this is Vinod Kosha. He's a co-founder of Sun Microsystems. He's holding my phone, actually. And my phone has a cover that was developed by my friend on the Gold Coast. Okay, as the company is called Alive Core. And Vinod Koshal basically said, oh, well, Vinod Koshal holding my phone because he invested, I think, uh, quite, a, quite a big amount of money in his company. Um, so you put your finger on this plate and it will take your ECG and it will tell you if you're having a heart attack. It goes to the cloud. It already saved three lives. And for the longest time, Australians can't buy it because the company is bought up by the Americans and the Americans don't really care about the Australian market and you need an FDA approval and so forth. But I think two weeks ago, they managed to allow uh, anybody to buy this cover now and you can put your fingers onto it and I think if for like 10 bucks you can get a real cardiologist interpret your ECG reading and let you know whether you're having the issues with your heart or not. So Vinod Koshal basically said that with technology like this, in the very near future, 80% of GPs are going to be redundant because you won't see a doctor for most of these things, right? You can probably get your blood drop into a uh, small little vial into a machine that will upload all the information uh, for your diagnostics and basically you can treat it, bring your own vitamins or your own medicine. Um, and another example of, uh, of, uh, of exponential technology growth is mobile phones, right? Look in Africa, right? Actually, that's, 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 uh, that's actually wrong now. 20, by the end of 2013 is 80% now. It has grown from 2% to 80%. As you can see in the uh, caricature cartoon there, right? A Maasai warrior in the middle of the Nairobi park actually has access to more information than Bill Clinton did when he was the President of the United States. Right? And that's kind of leveling the playing field. There are one billion Africans you know, in the world. And there's this whole idea of dematerialization of stuff, right? I mean, I guess most of you are too young to remember, but the first video player that came out was like three grand, and you know, you got an encyclopedia that, you know, on a CD that was like a grand and so forth. If you, you know, if you, now it's all gone, right? The video camera, the GPS system, you know, everything's on your phone. And you can probably get it on this phone for less than hundred dollars now, and that's leveling the playing field. The Africans don't have to go through the whole technology cycle that we did. They buy one of these devices, and they have all this on the palm of their hand. Um, and 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 uh, well, I talk about Moore's law, right? How computer is doubling every every um, eighteen months and so on. As you can see, it's growing exponentially. But I don't know whether you guys know. Like I mean, you know, the other one that's growing really, really fast is data. You heard of big data, the cloud, and all that stuff. What, what is it? Well, do you know that from the start of time of civilization, the first caveman painting to 2003, we generated five exobytes of data, right? That's five billion gigabytes of data. That's every piece of music Mozart wrote, you know, every, you know, uh, literature that uh, uh, J.K. Rowling wrote, and so forth. That's five billion gigabytes of data, right? Guess how long it takes us to generate this amount of data today? Anyone? Five years? Five minutes? Actually, uh, it goes as ten minutes. Probably less than that. If you if, if you think about it, why, right? Because the thing is that um, you know, look at the cameras, right? Your resolution are much higher. So I have MRI scans, um, you know, and over a hundred hours of video content is uploaded every minute to YouTube. So and that's still growing. I don't know whether you know that the cost of sequencing your genes has fallen faster than Moore's law. It used to cost a billion dollars 10 years ago and it costs about a thousand dollars or less today. Um, and why is this important? Why, why is sequencing your gene a big deal? Okay, well, one of the reasons why is because it has opened up new areas like pharmacogenomics, prescribing medication to you according to your genetic markers. Most of the medication that you and I take are tested on a small population, mainly in the Western world. You and I may have genetic markers that actually uh, react badly to the medication or the dosage that have been prescribed to us because it's not, it's not basically customized and personalized to our markers. Um, and do you guys know why, um, why drug discovery is known as drug discovery and not drug development in the pharmaceutical industry? 
Exactly. They have no idea how it works. They just try anything. It's like Edison trying to find the right filament, the right element for the filament of a light bulb. They just try anything they can. If it works, sell it to you. Right? I mean, that's how Viagra, I mean, it was actually started out as a, as a um, blood pressure medication. They gave it out as a drug trial to males and females. And then they found out that, you know, economically it didn't make sense. There were too many competitors in the marketplace. So what they did was they essentially decided to um, can, it, can the experiment, recall the drugs back. All the ladies gave it back, none of the men did. <laughs> Thus, Viagra was born. So, so this, is, this is changing the stuff that, you know, we are we're beginning to understand how to prescribe medication according to our genetic markers. If you read some of the stuff in my blog, um, there's this doctor who had leukemia, and he is like a world expert in leukemia, and he has stage four leukemia. And they were looking, sequencing genes for leukemia, and they found out that they had a drug for one of his um, genetic marker, and they gave it to him, and he was cured. Because, it, but the amazing thing was they're saying like how hard it is, if you're the world expert in the disease that you have, who do you see? Right? Because you go see a doctor and the guy said take this, like, you know it doesn't work. <laughs> um, the other thing is epigenetics. When you get sick, right? How often does a doctor ask you, like, um, where have you been, what have you been exposed to? Because one of the things that trigger our gene markers is, is uh, basically the environment. Epigenetics is how the genes react to the environment. You might have sniffed a new um, substance that actually creates some kind of reaction. So the one area that I really think you guys should know about, and if you don't already know, and you should work on and learn about this area, is synthesis biology. Right? This is my classmate, uh, Pablo Saltman from Uruguay. We're having a spit party at Singularity. We're spitting into a test tube at a company called 23 and Me. I don't know whether you heard of 23 and Me. Yep. So anyway, um, anyway, 23 and Me basically sequenced the genes until last November. We have FDA now don't allow them to reveal to you what I'm going to show you, which is my medical profile of my genetic markers. You spit into a test tube, within six weeks they send you an email, you log in, and they can tell you what kind of possible uh, diseases or risks that you might have. For example, I have a high, higher risk than normal of getting age-related macular degeneration of the eye, so I know that I should get more regular eye checkup, and so forth, right? Um, interesting things too is like, you know, most Asians have this gene that if you drink alcohol, you turn red, yeah. except Bishop. But, uh, yeah, I don't have that. So, you know, so they say I've been drinking and I'm still sober. No, I'm kidding. But anyway, um, you know, it tells you your wax is dry and so on. But the more important stuff, like a drug responses, you know what kind of medication and what kind of reaction on, on you. Like, you know, like I have a higher reaction to warfarin if I ever take it. Um, I showed this to my doctor and they're like, yeah, don't worry about it. So, uh, and, 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 and you can't get this data now, unfortunately, in the US because uh, 23 and Me has been prevented by the Food Drug Administration because they don't want people to panic and like they had the BRCA1 gene here for breast cancer. They were worried that people are going to take this data and go to the doctor and say, I want my breast cut off. They're like Angela Jolie and so forth. So there was a reason that they did it, but I don't know. I mean, there might be other reasons, you know, the drug companies might not want you to uh, get some of this data and so forth. So unfortunately, this has been gone. But the other interesting thing is um, your, your ancestry. So, so my, this, is, this is my genetic markers from my father's side of the family. My father's, my grandfather on my father's side is from Hainan Island, a small little island off the uh, coast of China, right? It's like the Hawaii of the east. So nothing really interesting here. We, you know, very highly correlated to the Chinese and some Siberians and some Maoris maybe in New Zealand. Um, but my mom's side of the family um, are from the southern part of China called Fuzhou. And look at this, I'm highly correlated to the Native American Indians. So I'm thinking of going back to the U.S. and claim some Indian reservation land, open a casino, and come back here, and you guys are gonna call me Chi Sitting Ten. <laughs> so this is a company in Singularity University called um, Genome Compiler or BioCompiler. Programming your genes—I don't know whether you guys know—is like um, programming computer programs. If you write the same code, it will do the same thing. So, except that it's not 0 and 1, it's base 4, it's not base 2, it's A, B, C, G. Okay, let me give you an example. Let's say I want to make a cat glow in the dark. How would I do it? Okay. I will go to this company called Complete Genomics, right? For $2,000 in about 3 days, I can take my cat's hair or saliva or whatever, send it then. And, by the way, Complete Genomics now has been bought out by the Chinese. And the world's biggest gene sequencer is the Beijing Genomics Institute. The Chinese are sequencing not only human genes, they're sequencing anything that tastes good. Because <laughs> uh, that's the future, the technology is there, right? I mean, whoever owns that IP, basically, you know, um, 
has the ability to um, create some amazing food product. So anyway, um, okay, once I've done that, then I need to get the glow the dark gene of, of uh, to make a pet glow, right? So I can go to open source DNA and download the genetic material for uh, the DNA material of a glow the dark gene of a jellyfish, right? Then I go to DNA 2.0 and download this software called Gene Designer 2.0. It's free. Download the software. You know, program it, play with it until you're happy with it, and then send it back to DNA 2.0 for again about two, three thousand dollars in three or four days. They will send you the genetic material that you can inject into your cat. And look, I got a glow in that cat. Yeah, but you know the Asians are very fussy, right? They don't like green, so I can make the cat red. So, um, but this has already been done right now in the US, so it's not really something new. But what's interesting was my classmates. Um, Last year I was invited to speak at TEDx KL, but I was actually at NASA. So my classmate Singularity, they were working on a project. It was the fastest, one of the fastest Kickstarter funded project in the US. They wanted to make a glow in the dark plant. Yeah. And uh, they did this and they raised something, I can't remember, like $400,000 or whatever. But essentially, um, think about it, right? If you have a glow in the dark, I give a talk at Ergon, and they were asking, like, oh, Clarence, you know, like, you know, we're going to be privatized soon, and we're going to have all these competitions, solar panels, and power prices dropping. I said, mate. If this guy is successful in creating glow the dark plant, my solar panels will be working at night too. You don't even need street lamps anymore, and all you need is water, fertilizer, and some air, right? And uh, basically, so how green can you get? And this is Andrew Hassel, which is one of the singularity hit in uh, synthesis biology area. And he said that in the future, a virus is nothing more than a software. And it's going to be an app for your body. You want to be a blonde, you inject it, you'll be a blonde. You want to grow a new arm, you can't grow a new arm. You want to have a trunk, you can. So, um, so these are things that are coming, and coming very fast. Um, area robotics, you know, this is actually a visit I went to in uh, uh, intuitive surgery. Uh, really interesting. You sit down on this uh, console, and you manipulate this machine, and it will actually operate you. If you've got to watch the movie Prometheus, you know, you see this thing, a robot cuts you up. Well, something like that. They still have a fiber optic cable right now. Uh, they said that in future, obviously, you can, have, uh, you can do it remotely from by internet. But obviously, you know, like if you have Telstra or on the net or something, and, you know, doing an appendix surgery and you know, network goes down, that's a bit dangerous. Um, anyway, the, the inventor of this product, uh, Catherine Moore, she told me that you do not have to be a surgeon to use this machine, just as long as you've got a good pair of hands. So if your kids play video games, let them do it, because there's a future there. They could be in future operating on you know, patients, except that doctors still have to view the entire procedure from somewhere remote. Um, this is the uh, PRS robot from Widow Garage, and that's a telepresent robot here on the right, and that's Jonathan Knowles. Um, they use it at Autodesk, so he doesn't come to work anymore. He just has this robot go around, talk to people and stuff. And some of the Singularity guys said that when they go to a cocktail party as a telepresent robot, they meet more interesting people than they do in person. You know, they met Robin Williams and so forth. And we built one for $600. So it's nothing more than an iPad, you know, uh, basically a broomstick pole and an iRoomba robot. Uh, yeah, the, you know, the, the, the cleaning robot. Um, and Peter Diamandis uh, um, just had a pair of twins, and so he couldn't come from Los Angeles, so he gave the whole talk as a telepresent robot. This is Phil Rossdale. If you don't know who he is, he's the father of Galvata, basically. He, this is the guy who created Second Life. Hmm. Uh, he has his new company now called um, uh, it's called high fidelity. Okay, so you heard it here first because um, he's basically trying to create live avatars that you can actually feel and shake hands and do stuff with. And he's hiring right now. Um, really interesting stuff about what he told us, uh, you know, in terms of uh, how humans interact with avatars. Like he was saying that in Second Life, IBM bought spaces to do like a seminar and they found more effective than doing a spat call. Why? Even though you go to this talk and sitting in these virtual rooms, as avatar, it could be a dog, it could be a cat, it could be whatever you want. But then during the coffee break, people gather around and chat with each other, and that's where the innovative ideas came out of. You don't do that. You can't. You can't see a lot of uh, body expression when you're on a Skype call or a teleconference. And so it's creating this so that you can actually um, detect every nuance of the face and uh, be able to um, display it. Because um, I don't know whether you guys know about robotics. You know, in terms of like creating robots that are really lifelike. There's something called an uncanny valley. If you make a robot look like a robot, nobody's worried about it, right? Yeah, he knows a robot. But it looks like 
real, but not really real because the facial expression don't actually make us, you know, people get afraid of it. It's called the uncanny valley. So what they're trying to do is trying to basically have this kind of product to do that. So if you're interested, there's an app called Moody's, just released about three weeks ago from uh, Israel. Uh, it's a company called Beyond Verbal. So if you, if you turn on the app, it's free, and the guy is talking to you, it will actually tell you how the guy is feeling. It detects the nuances of your voice. So you can try on a baby, you can try on, you know, on anybody. So when you're talking to somebody in a meeting, you know whether they're lying or they're anxious or whatever. But for robotics, uh, so this is actually a Beyond Verbal. The app is called Moody's. Um, and the other thing that's coming obviously is self navigation cars, you know, using what they call LiDAR, laser and radar. Because humans do not drive cars very well, as Paul just told me, you know, coming down from Brisbane. You know, robots do it very well. So why are we trying to be a robot, right? So the self navigation car is uh, something that's real and you might actually eliminate the need of owning a car. Um, but the problem is in AI, right? Those who are, uh, and those who are doing uh, studies in tactics and so forth. How do you program a robot? For example, if you're driving down a bridge and a school bus full of kids is rushing towards you. As a robot program, do you drive off the bridge, kill yourself and save everybody else? Or do you ram into the school bus? Some things that humans, you know, these are all big areas of research. So if you guys are postgrad students doing research, you know, these are really right areas for you to think about. Like how would you actually cope with things like that? How would an AI program cope? Um, this is, uh, I, I think my skip is still about drones, as you know, you know, um, drones are getting cheaper and so on, but Amazon is delivering stuff, you know, they want to do that, but this is not realistic though, because if you want to deliver to a high density place where there are a lot of apartments and so on, you'll, be, you know, you'll, you'll probably get lost, right? And the cost of the drone at the moment will be more than the product that you're buying. But just, uh, just, to, just, just to let you know that if you're worried about drones spying on you, you can buy this product called Drone Shield, stick it outside your house, it has got sensors that can detect very high pitch sounds of drones. So it will alert you, so you can go into your house and close your windows. Uh, <laughs> uh, gamification, okay, this is one I, I want to get through to you guys. This is my son, right? Uh, he's playing computer games, listening to music, and, and you know, doing what you guys would normally do, right? Why, why do we like to play games? Anybody? Do you know why humans like to play games? Why do you guys like to play games? What? Yeah, because, you, because humans like to solve problems. And we know there's a solution to this problem, right? This one in the game, you can go to the next level. And we like quick rewards, which is, which is not a problem we have in the schooling system here, right? Because the problem is that in schools, we don't get our exam results so much later. You don't get immediate results, but in games you do. We like to solve problems, right? And we like to be rewarded very quickly for it. So how can you make use of it? This is an example, uh, the simplest I can find, a gamification of the men's urinal. So for the ladies, a men's urinal, you know, if you've never been to a men's toilet, it's normally pretty messy. And somebody had a brilliant idea, this in the Sheeple app on an Amsterdam, you stick this sticker onto the urinal, and somehow men just like to shoot at things, and <laughs> they will keep the toilet 80% cleaner. Uh, you can actually buy this now in uh, Denso, I think, in uh, Australia Fair. So no instruction manual required, it's a very simple one. But how about this? This is a, this is a, you know, like how many of you have got speeding tickets? Yeah, Alright. Alright, we always get punished, right, for speeding. How about rewarding us for not speeding? So this back up the idea, actually they did this in Sweden, uh, the idea from New York. Uh, essentially, if you don't, if you speed, you get fined. The money goes to a jackpot. If you don't speed, you get a lucky draw to win the jackpot. And there were like 22% safer drivers. Uh, this is an amazing one. This was uh, a year before me in Singularity. One of the, uh, one of the um, uh, students in there, he's a medical doctor from WHO. He was very inspired from what he learned in Singularity and he wanted to know why despite the billions being spent to eradicate malaria, it was still killing hundreds of thousands of people. And he decided to go to Africa and India and find out why. And one of the biggest bottleneck of why people are dying of malaria is because um, when you are suspected of having malaria, you get a blood test, right? And um, somebody has to put the blood sample onto a microscope and then count the number of parasites in your bloodstream to know what condition you are, what stage of malaria um, you, know, you have and what medication to give you. So what this guy did was upload all the slides. It takes 20 minutes to count per technician, per slide. So what he did was upload all the slides onto the cloud. 
made into a game. So go to malariaspot.org. Every time you shoot the parasite, you're helping them come. And they're still 10,000 likes now. So instead of playing Angry Birds and Flat Bird and you know, uh, Candy Crush, if you play Valeria Sport, you're actually saving a life. And then the other one is Folded, right? You guys have heard of Folded? Yeah, so Folded is basically developed in the University of Washington. They spent $12 million and uh, 18 months trying to find a way to fold protein in such a manner that they can kill the HIV virus. Uh, they spent all that money and all the time couldn't find a solution. Somebody made into a game. So if you go to this game, they teach you from basic techniques. It's like Rubik's Cubes. Humans are very good at solving puzzles like Rubik's Cubes. So now the world tops, I mean, some of the world top scorers in Folded is not a scientist or a graduate. It's actually, um, I think, a personal assistant in London. And that's the amazing thing about technology, right? We are enabling anybody to perhaps find a cure for HIV without having them to have to go through a whole postgraduate program. I guess in the wrong forum, but... Uh, so you guys should do things like this. You can harness more people to do this. Um, I'm not sure you've seen play to cure genes in space. You know, this, this came out two weeks ago. So essentially, it's a, it's a video game, but you're helping them find uh, the genetic markers for, uh, for cancer, for breast cancer in London. So the project that I worked on when I was at like Singularity, I was a team leader for a project called Corruption Tracker. So essentially, we are trying to give voice to people that don't have a voice. Um, what do I mean? So in an act of corruption, right, the person that pays the money gets what he wants, so he's not going to complain about it. The guy who got the money obviously is not going to want it, right? But what happens if, if you can't afford to pay the bribe? Let's say you are, uh, you're, you're living in India and you need to bribe to get a driving license so you can get a better job, but you're stuck. You can't afford the bribe, therefore you're stuck forever. So we wanted to give them a voice and that's how the project came about. The amazing thing is that, you know, I gave this talk, you know, for my project in front of the same audience, on the same stage as Rick Hoffman, the founder of LinkedIn and Vinod Koshal and so forth. Um, so, but this, it got really dangerous as a team leader, so we gave this project away to Transparency International. The whole idea was that you see a corruption, that corruption, you SMS, you tweet it, you email it, and immediately it gets, um, it gets, um, uh, it gets published onto a map. And don't worry about this stuff, this was actually, the good thing about this project was, I came on the dark side as uh, what Bishop told you of the industry, right? I came from the investment banking in the 80s when greed was good in Wall Street, right? I'm reformed now. So, um, I have no idea what a social enterprise was, but at Singularity, one of my classmates was the head of business development for the Ashoka Foundation. They give away $100,000 to anybody in the world that will become the next Gandhi, right? That he, she explained to me very simply, she said, look, right now in the world, there are two kinds of corporations. You have NGOs, right, and nonprofits, which basically depends on donations to survive, right? Which is not sustainable because you've got to give money for sponsorship and donation. On the other hand, you have corporations. Any any business majors in here? Accountants? What is the uh, main objective of a corporation? Or a director of a corporation? Profit. Maximize shareholders' profit. Very good. That's not sustainable either because if you're given a choice between chopping down the trees and moving all the natives, and as long as it's legal, you have to do it by law. So that's not sustainable either, right? So there's a convergence now, what they call a social enterprise, where your first objective is to make sure that you have a positive impact on society. And your second objective is to make sure that you're profitable, so you are sustainable. So Singularity University started as a non-profit. But then as a non-profit, you can't provide advisory services, you can't take shares, you can't do a number of things. But they didn't want to be a corporation either, because if it became a corporation, then they had to maximize shareholders' profit. So Singularity University became what they term as a benefit corporation. It's a new corporation and you have to check it out. California and Canada now has that. So, so Singularity is now a benefit, California benefit corporation where the constitution of your company dictates what your objective is. You don't have to be maximizing shareholders' profit. So some of the projects that came out of Singularity, Metanet is like a Pony Express for delivering medications, a drone. So you carry medication up to 10 kilos uh, two miles, and then it lands, and then it pass on a parcel to the next drone, and they'll deliver it to places where there are no roads, so they can deliver medication and so forth. What really inspired me a couple of years ago when I went back to Singularity was this Indonesian girl who won a competition in Indonesia, went to Singularity and worked with two Israeli guys, and created this product in three weeks. It's called Medic Sensation. It's a glove that allows women to check their own breasts for lumps. 
Because if you think about a third world country where there are no roads and no power, how are you going to bring a breastfeeding clinic into a place like that? With this glove, you could you basically get sensors on it. You basically can put the data onto an SD card and then get it sent back and monitor it. But the, the part of my story is that this lady would never have the opportunity to work with these Israeli guys because they have no diplomatic relationship. But at Singularity, they did. And they actually went to Chile and set up a company there. Um, and Blue Box was a project that came out last year. So a bunch of guys at Singularity hacked a Blu-ray player. So you put a drop of blood onto a special Blu-ray DVD and it will basically read your blood scan and give you all the diagnostics without having to send it to a pathology lab from your computer. And this is one of my favorite groups, the Archie group. They create this ultrasonic um, uh, denture. I mean, how, how many of you hate brushing your teeth in the morning? I mean, you know, it takes like two minutes, right? You have 30 seconds on each side. Have you guys heard of an ultrasonic toothbrush? Not sonic care, but ultrasonic toothbrush. You don't actually have to brush your teeth, just place it on top of your teeth. It emits ultrasonic sound, create micro bubbles, which then removes all your plug. Well, this, you know, you still got to do it. I actually bought one because I learned from this guy such a device. It's actually it's pretty good. But the problem is that you still got to do 30 seconds on each side of the teeth, right? So these guys 3D scan your, your mouth, create 3D print this, uh, it's, like a, it's like a mouth guard with ultrasonic sensors in it, and, uh, ultrasonic emitters in it. Put it into your mouth, in 30 seconds you're done. You don't need to brush your teeth. Uh, this Bulgarian guy won the competition and went to Singularity with his idea. His idea is to create a smart hive. He's trying to save bees to save humans. Right? You guys know that bees are dying. And one of the reasons why they're dying is because they've been exposed to fungicide. So what he has created is a, is a sensor, uh, a, a beehive with sensors in it. If a bee tries to enter the hive and has been exposed to the fungicide, it will shut the door on the bee, so it can't come in. If the, if, if the bee, if the hive is compromised, the entire hive will actually shut down. Um, so last year we sent one guy from Australia to Singularity. Um, and he, his idea was carpooling, I'll talk a little bit about it afterwards, but he went there and worked on this project called Livestock. You guys seen that uh, how you can 3D print meat, right? So in future you never have to kill another animal. Essentially you can 3D print meat, beef, right? So Singularity put enough string, this guy actually flew to London to witness the uh, University of Metric Maastricht uh, 300,000 pounds hamburger, right? Apparently it didn't taste that good because uh, it was healthy for you because it wasn't much fat. A hamburger needs to be fatty, this one was not, was lean. So the guys at Livestock is working on a NASA 3D printing system for printing not beef, but chicken and fish. Uh, the guys at Modern Meadows are working on uh, 3D printing leather and beef from uh, stem cells. It's actually formed by a guy, that's a father and son team. The father is a scientist, the son, they actually had a company called Organovo. They sold for $750 million. And what it does is basically, uh, raw organs and uh, tissues for medical research. Um, this is uh, uh, Rob Reinhardt. You guys have heard of soy lamp. Last year he, he had his open source thing. He basically said that he got tired of eating, right? You know, it takes too much time eating and all that. He, so he found, found out exactly what nutrients the body needs. So you can see at the bottom there is exactly the nutrients you need. Make it do a drink, just drink it. So for one month, he ate nothing but just drank this stuff and he felt great and he lost weight and so on. But I met him at Singularity and I asked him, I said, what's the real reason, Rob? I mean, was it really all that cool? He said the real reason is because he was an entrepreneur and he ran out of money and you cannot buy um, a proper meal in McDonald's for less than 450. So he actually created this for himself and now he has raised over a few million dollars now. So um, he's trying to fight, food, uh, trying to fight uh, world hunger with uh, his technology. So let me end with uh, just a few notes on the future, right? The future, you guys know how robots are replacing humans and so forth. That's true. Any, anybody that can be replaced by a machine will be replaced by a machine. So if you're going to be working in a job that can be replaced by a machine, make sure that you can work with the machine, right? Because if not, you'll be, you'll be replaced. I mean, the world has changed. Look at Kodak, right? Kodak has 150,000 employees, right? One of the world's largest company it invented the digital camera. It's gone. The digital camera killed it, right? So there's a new saying now. If you do not disrupt yourself, somebody will disrupt you. Look at Instagram, 12 people, $1.2 billion. Okay, so Baxter is one of the programs that you should look at, like a robotic program that, that works with humans. See, robots are replacing jobs that we don't really want to do anyway. Like, you know, it's helping nurses change sheets, 
take the big pens, which they don't want to do anyway. So, you know, when we talk about um, robots replacing jobs, it's really the mundane jobs that we don't want to do anyway. And our education system can be reformed, right? Because the way that we are doing, you know, everybody has been classified, um, you know, take the same exam, have the same answers. If your answer is different, you're wrong. So how do you create innovation like that? You gotta change that. The education system we have, if you watch Subhata Mitra or Ken Robinson, is inherited from the British Empire. It made humans into machines, right? To read, write, and compute, the three R's. I mean, I just came from a student parent meeting with my, 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 my kid's parent, uh, my son's uh, teachers uh, last week about his handwriting. I mean, this is always the same shit, right? I mean, like, <laughs> you gotta get them to learn how to do it right. They're like, they spend hours trying to write well, like, why? I mean, how many of you actually write? I don't even have a pen. I mean, you know, like you type or you'll be using voice recognition. But it's still so archaic. So, well, when he, when he wants to sit for the exam, you have to write. And this is ridiculous, right? So this is the problem that we have, but it needs to change. Um, watch the better Mitra's talk, you know, he um, won last year's tech talk. He's very famous for what he did. Uh, it's called the computer, uh, the hole in the wall project. Basically, about know, six years ago, um, he did an experiment. All his friends were calling him and saying, you know, there was when computer, personal computers was just becoming big widespread in India. All his friends who were rich enough to buy a computer for the kids were calling him and saying, oh, my son is really, really smart. He's making all this amazing stuff. And, uh, and my daughter is creating fantastic graphics. So he was saying like, is it only kids that have rich parents that are smart? Or any kid with a computer can be smart. So he took a computer and stuck it on a wall in a slum in India. And within three weeks, they were downloading music and uploading stuff and doing things by themselves. They never seen a machine in their life. So this has been repeated many, many times. So he's created this thing called the um, self-organized learning environment. He said a teacher's function is to help the kids learn by themselves, not tell them what the answer the back of the book is, right? Or how to find the answer the back of the book is. So I encourage you guys to have a look at that. And you know, okay, this is the wrong form again. But if you want to do an MBA, I did an MBA. You know, you don't you can get the best programs, right? On the web. For less than a thousand dollars, if it's knowledge that you want, if it's network that you want, it's different, right? I mean, among yourself, you guys are all here because you're all motivated. That's where the network is. You can socialize too around this, you know, basically with uh, on, on, on the net. And this is Jack and Dracker, right? Seven, no, 15 year old kid, he's probably 16 and a half now. If you guys seen the video on him, this is a kid, 15 year old, was very motivated to find uh, early detection for pancreatic cancer because his uh, father's best friend passed away of pancreatic cancer. If you know anything about pancreatic cancer, when you're diagnosed with it, you know, you die very quickly. So the, 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 the current test that we have is 50 years old or 35 years old. So there are no other, you know, basically in his own words, um, it's like looking for a needle in the haystack where the haystack is full of needles of the same size. Okay, and he wrote to 200 scientists at John Hopkins University when he lives in Maryland uh, to see whether they would work with him to try and find an early detection uh, test. He had 199 rejection. You know, and one professor that went through every single point and, 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 and tell him why it's wrong. Except one guy said, well, come to my lab and talk to my post-grad students. And uh, within six months, he developed this technology and uh, basically now it is, I think, 20, 26,000 times faster and 120 times cheaper. Um, so amazing, amazing guy. So if he can do that, I'm sure you guys can do more amazing things, right? So basically, just leave you with this last quotation from Larry Page, right? Are you working on something that can change the world? Yes or no? All right? The answer for most people is not. And if you're not, why not, right? So that's why I try and try and work on something that will impact a billion people and that has changed my view on investing too right now so I'll, you know, invest in projects that will have big impact because if you're going to work on a project that will impact a few people it's going to be just as hard as working to impact a billion people okay, so this is the guy that won the competition last year from Australia um, his idea was carpooling, it looks like a simple idea but everybody knows carpooling is good but nobody does it, why? had to find the right person, travel in the right place at the right time his idea was very simple, create an app Turn on your phone, drive to work like you would every day, have your friends use the app, give, your, uh, give it access to your social media friends. And if you know your friends traveling the same direction, I know Paul goes the same way that I do every day, the program will match us up. And because I know him, I would probably be more likely to carpool with him. So he went over there with that idea, but he ended up working on the idea of printing fish or chicken. <laughs> uh, and this is the guy from the Gold Coast that I'm mentoring, he came second. He is trying to use comedy to prevent suicide. Uh, it's amazing, I mean, you know, like, 
like you guys don't think about it, right? Tow truck drivers are one of the most stressed person on earth. I didn't know that, right? And, and comedians are one of the most uh, depressed people too. So he actually wanted to use comedy to change the world, uh, to try and prevent uh, suicide. So thank you very much. Sorry I took a bit of time. Because we won't be able to tell the difference between augmented reality 
and what's, what's real and what's not. Because you'll be able to feel, sense everything. Once you have that ability, right, we don't even need to send humans to Mars. We can actually send sensors to Mars. Whatever the sensors feel, we will feel it anyway. So, so that's, I mean, you know, yeah, these are all very, very uh, interesting questions that we need to work on. Don't have all the answers, right? No, no, no. Yeah. You can even send humans on trajectories like red space and the plots and keep them frozen. Yeah. Well, you don't even need to, right? That's what I'm saying, because now you can actually just send sensors up there. Yeah. And uh, they can, because they're small, they can travel faster than yeah. uh, humans. Yeah. In fact, you know, with the drones, the drones can basically sit, you know, go around the Earth for like, I think, a week without know, humans, because there's no human support system in there. Right. At a singular university, do they have a sort of ethics oversight? They do. Yeah. I mean, so I think they actually teach right? ethics. You know, like, uh, you know, they bring out the guys from, you know, from Gina and so on. I didn't talk about like uh, 3D printing of guns. Uh, they actually brought the guy who designed 3D printing of guns last, uh, last year to Singularity to talk about why he did it and, and so forth. Kurt, Cody Wilson? Yes. Yeah. So he was at Singularity last year. Um, yeah, so they, they bring up all this stuff so that you know you guys can think about um, how you can go about doing it and what are the implications and so forth. I mean, the other one that's, um, that, 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 that's always uh, interesting is um, robot sex. If we don't fight aging in, 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 uh, you know, soon enough, people are aging right, very rapidly, but they still have physical needs and so on, they're still disabled. What are they going to do? Are they going to go to King's Run to pick up a chick? Can't do that, right? They will probably get killed and so on. And that's where you know, like the intimacy and the uh, and the relationship with the machine is changing the way that uh, things are happening. But it's really interesting. I was reading this article that one of the Japanese have invented some of these products that actually allow a, a person to interface with the machine, right? But the person felt empathy for the um, for for the uh, for the avatar. They actually felt like they come at a psychological point. They actually felt for the, even though it wasn't a real thing, people felt what it was. If you watch um, yeah. Singularity is Near, actually there was all Ray also talked about like how at the end of the day the avatar becomes so human-like that you have to give it humanoids. I think we'll wrap it up there. We've got some catering outside uh, that, so we can kind of continue these conversations, talk to some of the people around us. Um, some amazing things happening in the world. I'm partly just scared, amazed, and realize how much <laughs> I don't know. Um, once again, thank you very much, Dr. Ken. Yeah, I didn't realize I was in my bag.